Peter Rossi here um, to talk a little bit about um, estimating causal effects uh, with treatment data, non-experimental treatment data, um, and basically to illustrate the ideas that uh, Tony Fagan from Google brought into our class. Okay, so the, the, the basic idea that we, what a causal effect is, is the effect of a treatment on an individual. Unfortunately, an individual can only be observed either with or without the treatment. So the idea of a causal effect is it's the effect um, for me if I hadn't uh, uh, um, been exposed to the treatment versus what my uh, the effect my response would be if I had been exposed. So for example, in the case we have here, it's about a promotional video for this Nexus 7 uh, phone product. So the treatment is the exposure to the promotional video. And for me, I would say, what's my probability of buying the phone, having been exposed to the treatment? And then the counterfactual is, suppose I hadn't been exposed to the treatment, what's the probability of my buying the phone? That's never observed if I'm in the treatment group. Similarly, for the people who are in the non-treatment group or so-called control group, having not been exposed to the, to the video, we don't know what they would have done if they had been exposed to the video. So that's the problem. Randomization, as Tony um, uh, argued, uh, is the most effective way to eliminate this problem. That is to say, to randomize the treatment so that everyone, um, the treatment exposure to the treatment is not dependent on any characteristics of any individual, their proclivity to buy the product or anything of that sort, their response to the treatment. So they just randomly assign it. If there are enough people assigned to the experimental and control groups, then you just simply uh, compute the difference in response. So you have the experimental group, meaning the, well, those exposed to the promotional video. You calculate their, promote, their, their probability of purchasing the phone, and you subtract that from the probability for those people in the control group. Um, and that's the unfortunately, that's the problem with uh, passively observed data is that exposure to the treatment, in this case the video, is not random. The set of people that uh, choose to watch videos are different from the set of people who generally have lower a lower uh, proclivity to watch videos. And then the question becomes, can we adjust for that? So let's take a look um, at the data. Let's read in the data. Here I'm reading in the data uh, using the read CSV function. That creates this little data frame called the Nexus data frame. In that data frame, of course, are the variables, the whether they watch the promotion, watch.promo, which is the treatment variable. And then the response variable is whether they bought Nexus. Both are discrete variables, binary variables or dummy variables. So we're, the response variable is going to be the buying variable, and the, and the um, treatment will be the independent variable. In addition, we have some information on the people in our sample as to whether their, their, their proclivity or uh, amount of videos they watch, their browser type, and so on, as well as the standard demographics like age and, and, and gender. Um, now, so the first thing we might do is treat watching the video as though it were randomly assigned in a true experiment. And there, all we have to do essentially is just fit a um, logistic regression of the buying the nexus, the, uh, the outcome variable, on whether they uh, watch the promotion video. And I'm going to do that here in this line, fit.naive, right, meaning naive, it's a naive view of the world. Let's run that. And what is in fit.naive? Let's take the summary of that. And what is in fit.naive is the standard out output of a, a, a logit model, a logistic regression model. We can see here the coefficient on whether they watch the video is fairly large, statistically significant, and so on. Um, this model is highly significant. Its null deviance is much, much larger than its residual deviance. That, the difference would be a chi-squared one degree of freedom that's over 500. So there's no issue about significance of this regression. However, as we know, the coefficients in a logistic regression are not equal to the, they're not in the units of the response variable, which are the units of the response variable are essentially probabilities. So let's basically compute the naive estimate of the effect comparing the fitted probability of buying the Nexus phone given that you watched the video contrasted with what the model says the fitted probability would be not watching the video. And that's what I computed right here called effect naive. That's the difference in two prediction statements, right? Um, and let's run that. And effect naive 
is about 13.5%. Uh, so in other words, those people exposed to the video have a 13.5% higher probability of purchasing the phone. And that looks like a large effect. It's both significant and substantively large. The problem is that the people who bought the phone, excuse me, watched the video, are not a random sample of all people um, engaging in, you know, on, on YouTube. So um, in order to kind of get an idea of that, let's actually model the, the treatment as a function of observable characteristics of the people. So that's called fitting a propensity score, meaning the propensity to be included in treatment. If there is no relationship between treatment and any characteristics that we know of the individual, we could argue that the actual um, implementation of the treatment assignment was as though it were kind of like a random experiment. Uh, but we'll see qu uh, quickly that if we fit this model, uh, that the propensity scores, which are the outcomes of the model, are quite different. So in other words, these characteristics are highly related to whether they were treated. So let's Let's look at the summary of that fit. Um, prop for propensity score dot out. And you can see what we're doing here is we're modeling whether they watch the video as a function or relating it to their characteristics, such as the number of videos they've watched, their browser type, their device type, and their age, and so on. And you can see a number of these variables are highly significant. So it appears, for example, that um, you're much more likely to watch the promotional video if you are watch a lot of videos in electronics, which makes total sense. You're much less likely to, um, to watch the video if you, as you're older. So these are kind of young people interested in videos. They go on YouTube a lot, etc. So this means that the assignment to the treatment, which of course is non-random, it was just whatever people actually were exposed to the video, is not as though it were random. It's closely related to the characteristics of the individuals. Um, and another way of, of, of looking at that is to compute the propensity scores, what are called the propensity scores. That simply means the fitted probabilities from this logistic regression that we just did. So let's, let's look at that, those propensity scores, uh, which I call p-score for propensity score. And let's look at a histogram of the two scores over here, we'll see it emerge. Um, oops, I'm using this function called color alpha, which makes the histograms transparent to some extent. Um, let's run that. And okay, so here we see the blue colored histogram bars are the propensity scores for people who didn't watch the video, and the red and uh, including what looks like overlapping into the purple. Those are the, the scores of people um, who, who watch the video. So in other words, just another way of saying that the people who watch the video are much more likely to watch the video uh, based on their characteristics. So they are a different, a different set of people. So we can't regard the people who watch the video as equivalent to the set of people who didn't watch the video. So then the question is how to adjust for this. Well, we know how to adjust for this. You just simply add this propensity score, that's the probability of your getting a treatment, to the fitted logistic regression. It's like any regression model, right? When we want to get a pure effect, namely the coefficient on watch the promote, is correlated with other variables. We need to put those control variables in. We need to essentially run a multiple regression. Nothing more, nothing less than what we learned all quarter is that multiple regression coefficients are estimates of a pure or partial effect controlling for the other variables. So we're going to estimate the effect of watching the video controlling for your propensity to be treated or included in the watching video group. And that's just simply adding p-score to the model. So here we've just, I'm going to run another logistic regression with buying the Nexus phone regressed on whether you watch the promotion, that's the naive model, but I'm going to add the p-score, it's the fitted probabilities from the earlier propensity score regression. Though that's going to be like a summary of all these characteristic variables and how they impinge on whether you get treated. Um, so that's what we're gonna do here. Let's run that. And you can see then, that's called, I'm calling that fit.p-score. -score. So let's look at that model, summary of that model. 
Okay, and you can see that the um, and compare that to the summary of the fit.naive. And let me make this a little bit larger so you can contrast them. The fit not naive model has a coefficient of watch promo of 1.8. The model of the multiple logistic regression with, with controlling for the p score has a much lower coefficient estimate of 1.5. And you can see the p score is highly significant as we'd expect. Okay, so what we've established here is that the true causal effect is likely to be considerably less than that estimated by simply looking at the difference between those who the buying rates of those who were exposed to the video versus those who were not. Um, now, as we know, of course, the problem with all of these logistic regression models is the coefficients themselves are not in the units of the outcome variable or the probability of purchase. So what we're going to do here is use these models to calculate the probability for the, all those who were treated, namely exposed to the promotional video, we'll calculate the probability that they would buy. And then we'll turn off or simulate a world in which those same people would have not been exposed, but what they would have done had they not been exposed to the video. That is a counterfactual that can only be computed via the model, right? Being a modeling assumption. And we'll call the effect on the treated as the difference between those two things. So here, I'm doing that. I'm fetching the propensity score um, for those who are treated, and then I'm contrasting the model fit with, a, with for assuming they were treated with whatever their propensity score was versus assuming they were not treated with the same set of propensity score values. And I'm taking the difference of those. That will be one for every person, one number for every person in the treatment group, about 5,000 numbers, and we'll take the mean of those. And that will be the mean effect of the, of the uh, treatment, namely the video, uh, on those who were treated. And we get that that mean effect is about 12%. Um, uh, um, so this is less than the naive effect. Okay. Um, now, you might say, well, what we should do is suppose we wanted to compute the effect on the whole population of people. So in other words, suppose we were basically forced everyone to, to, to watch this video, what would be the effect in that population? And we can do that by looking at the set of people who didn't uh, watch the video, which is kind of a random sample of all these YouTube viewers, and computing the same difference over that. So let's do that. So I, here I'm just doing it for the people who did not, uh, uh, were not exposed. And you get a much lower a number, about a 9% differential. So the, the, the truth here is somewhere around 9%. In other words, the true causal effect is around 9%. So just to summarize, what we've done is we've taken um, the exposure to treatment, instead of assuming it's random, if we have to control for those factors that make some people more likely to be treated as well as more likely to respond favorably, if we control for those factors, we will get a, a truer estimate of the, what's a, what people call the causal effect or true effect of exposure to the video. And we see in this particular data set that that actually can make a, quite a bit of difference between about 13% um, and 9% response rate. So the, the true causal effect of watching the video is not 13%. It's probably uh, on the order of about 9%. Um, so I hope that gives everyone a little feeling for these propensity score methods. They're just standard extension of logistic regression to include another control variant, namely the propensity score, and there's nothing particularly new conceptually about that. It's just the way in which it's, it's applied.